So in this video, we're carrying on our thinking about cardiac function. How is the heart working? Why is it working? And here we've got a basic diagram of the heart. Now, we've done this in previous videos, but um, you really need to learn this if you're going to understand the heart. Then you can have fun colouring it in. So like now I'm colouring in the myocardium in red, the myocardial muscle, the active contractile musculature of the heart and we see here that I've uh, drawn the arterial valves in blue this is the aortic arterial valve going into the aorta this is the pulmonary arterial valve going into the pulmonary artery this is the tricuspid valve this is the bicuspid valve left atrium left ventricle right atrium right ventricle and that means that this represents the pulmonary veins going into the left atrium. And this represents the inferior and superior vena cava going into the right atrium. And why is it that we have a heart in the first place? Well, it sounds a silly question, but the reason is to generate a blood pressure to perfuse the tissues. So we need to perfuse tissues. So arterials, ar ar arteries will branch into arterial branches. So there we have an artery and it's going to branch into progressively smaller arterial branches, which as we know, go to arterioles. And very often these supply a particular area of tissue like this. An area of tissue supplied by arterial branches and sometimes which is really good there's a there's a collateral circulation as well um, so blood a particular area of tissue can derive a blood supply via another arterial route that's a, a collateral circulation this happens in the legs and arms quite a lot for example but unfortunately in the brain and the myocardium there's less collateral areas at the at the small tissue level anyway when we're considering perfusion of the tissues. So we need this blood pressure to perfuse the tissues. The pressure is generated here and perfuses the tissues with blood. The blood goes through the tissues. It's needed to perfuse it. And this will only happen if the pressure here is greater than the pressure here, as we push through the pressure, the pressure gradient. And that explains why the left ventricle needs to contract, ejecting blood into the systemic circulation to generate systemic arterial blood pressure. Now, blood pressure is often described as the pressure of the blood against the walls of the vessel in which that blood is contained. And that's true, that is blood pressure. But we can also think about blood pressure in terms of cardiac function, where blood pressure the blood pressure, thinking about now in the systemic circulation, the blood pressure equals the cardiac output. So this will be true in the pulmonary circulation as well. It's the cardiac output multiplied by the vascular resistance. And if we're thinking about the systemic circulation, it's the SVR, systemic vascular resistance. So blood pressure is defined by cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. And uh, cardiac output is equal to heart rate. That's the number of times the heart beats per minute multiplied by the stroke volume. That's the volume of blood ejected per cardiac contraction. So essential to learn these for the basic physiology. The blood pressure is the cardiac output multiplied by the resistance. The cardiac output itself is the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. So if the heart's beating 70 times a minute and the stroke volume is 70 mils, then that gives us 4,900 mils as the cardiac output. So that's actually a figure. So that's normally around about five liters. So it's about five liters per minute because if the heart rate's about 70 and the stroke volume is the same, but 72 for the heart rate times the stroke volume of 70 mils 
haven't worked it out precisely, but that's going to give us about five litres per minute cardiac output. And that's fascinating because five litres a minute is roughly equivalent to the total volume of blood. So all of the blood volume is going through a particular part of the circulatory system, such as the left ventricle, in a one minute period. And cardiac output is also dependent on venous return. So if the blood's not coming back to the heart, then the ventricle can't pump it out. So the blood has to be coming back to the heart. So the blood has to come back to the right side of the heart here to get to the lungs, going through the right side of the heart to the lungs. And it's only when the blood's been through the lungs that it can come back via the pulmonary veins to the left atrium to go to the left ventricle to be pumped out into the systemic circulation. So we need the blood getting back to the heart. So if the blood is leaking out somewhere, if the blood's leaking out through your foot or there's a, there's a hemorrhage somewhere, that's going to reduce venous return. And if venous return is sufficiently reduced, that's also going to reduce cardiac output. So this is true. Blood pressure equals uh, cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance in the presence of adequate venous return because cardiac output can't be maintained if there is not adequate venous return. And just before we go on to look at regulation, I think I'll mention the idea of a cardiac reserve, cardiac reserve. So here we have the heart beating at rest, generating our five litres or so of output of cardiac output. So there's going to be about five litres coming out of here a minute. Coming out of the aorta into the systemic circulation. And of course, it's got to be the same on this side as well. There's also five litres a minute coming out of the, the pulmonary artery. So the cardiac output in the from the right ventricle is the same as the cardiac output from the left ventricle. And if you think about it, this has to be the case, otherwise the pulmonary circulation would fill up with blood and this would empty if this was higher. Or conversely, if this was higher than this, the systemic circulation would fill up with blood and the pulmonary circulation would empty, which of course would be a completely unsatisfactory situation. So the cardiac output, in terms of volume, is the same on both sides of the heart, from the body pump and from the lung pump. Although we know the pressure here is much higher than the pressure on the pulmonary side, where lower pressures are required. So the cardiac reserve is the difference between this activity at rest and the maximum you can possibly generate. So when we go exercising, the heart rate is going to increase, the stroke volume is going to increase, and the cardiac output will therefore increase. And the cardiac reserve is the difference between the cardiac output at rest and the maximum cardiac output that can be generated. So um, I hate to think what it is in me at the moment, but in you it's probably four, five, or six, depends how fit you are. So in other words, you can increase your cardiac output by a factor of four or five. So if you increase it by a factor of four, that will go up to 20 litres per minute. If you increase it by a factor of five, that will go up to 25 litres per minute. And if you're a super athlete, that might be times seven or times eight your resting cardiac output. And in heart disease, of course, where the heart is not working as a pump properly, th th there is failure of the heart in some way in heart disease, then the cardiac output might be adequate during rest, but there will be a loss of the cardiac reserve. That's why these people become very unfit and will become very fatigued during any increase in physical activity. So what this idea of cardiac reserve teaches us is there's a great variability of cardiac workload that is required from very relatively low cardiac outputs at rest to very high cardiac outputs during emergencies or exercise or excitement. And what we want to look at is how this is regulated. And there's two ways really we want to do this. We want to look at how the activity of the heart is controlled within the heart itself and how this is controlled by uh, external factors as well. Because what we want is really blood pressure homeostasis. Homeostasis. We need the 
constant conditions. We, we need constant adjustment of the blood pressure to maintain the constant conditions in the body to facilitate the exercise. So this is really an aspect of homeostasis. How is this uh, occurring? Well, as we've mentioned, part of it is internal control within the heart, but then there's external controls as well. And the external controls we can divide into the uh, autonomic nervous system. So there's regulation by the autonomic nervous system and there's hormonal. Hormonal regulation as well. Now, the nervous system is able to adjust cardiac output very quickly over periods of a few seconds. So very often short term control is controlled by the autonomic, the automatic part of the nervous system. Now, hormonal control, um, actually, when you think about it, can be fairly short term. For example, the release of um, adrenaline or um, noradrenaline, that's epinephrine or norepinephrine, is released, as we've said, during uh, exercise, emergencies or excitement actually under the stimulation of the, the sympathetic nervous system. But if you have an injection of adrenaline, your heart rate is going to increase uh, really quite remarkably in, in a very short period of time. So there can be some short term hormonal effects, but also there's a lot of uh, longer term hormonal effects that, that can affect the functioning of the heart as well. And here we think particularly about the thyroid hormone, which can affect uh, cardiac function. People that are thyrotoxic can have fast heart rates. And we also want to think about the renin-angiotensin system. But before we go on to think about these, I think what we'll do first of all is we'll think about the internal control of the heart, how conditions are controlled within the heart so that cardiac contractions can be consistently maintained internally within the heart itself.